What's going on? Happy Saturday. I hope you guys are doing well wherever you're watching this from. Uh, my name is Ken Posick, and I'm a real estate agent here in Orlando, Florida. And today we're talking about all things real estate, theme parks, and living in Orlando. I'm going to take you behind the scenes on some developmental news, uh, theme parks, and how that actually affects what's going on here in Orlando. And then answer your questions along the way, because that's really what this is about, is finding out what questions you guys have about living in Orlando, owning a house here. Maybe you want to move here one day, or maybe you already live here and you just want to be a more informed consumer. So I hope you're doing well wherever you're at. Uh, Dina, what's going on? You said, oh, you got a question to begin with. That's amazing that you're jumping in. But first question we like to ask every time we go live is where are you watching from today? It helps me kind of figure out uh, a little bit more about our, our audience. Some people are watching from overseas. People are watching uh, from Canada, Brazil, the US, all over the US. So it's really, really cool. Uh, today, we're talking about a lot of different things as it concerns Orlando. I've got some real estate news and sort of a projection for 2023. I've got uh, some different uh, insights into developmental news. One actually fascinating thing over on East Orlando with a whole redevelopment of an old landfill that I dove into really deep and I'm excited to share with you guys. But uh, first off, where are you guys watching from? I appreciate it. Let's see. Uh, enjoying your content from Claremont instead of snowy Buffalo. I appreciate you checking in. What's going on from South Florida? I appreciate you guys checking in. Montgomery, Alabama, aka The Gump. <laughs> What's going on Tuesday, Watkins? Appreciate you checking in. Uh, Howell, Michigan. Uh, are you like, are you go blue? Because like Today is big day, big day in Michigan. If you are a Michigan football fan, you've got uh, Michigan Wolverines playing the Ohio State. Uh, so I hope you guys are doing well watching the game. Glasgow, Scotland. What's going on, Stuart? I appreciate you checking us out today. Uh, Joel from NYC, but spends way too much time in Lake Nona. Cheers for the conversation about Bob Iger we had over IG for sure. I'm actually going to dive into that a little bit more about today. Bob Iger taking over as CEO again. And what does that mean for Orlando? I'm excited to talk about that a little bit today. Um, Chicago suburbs, Annette, what's going on? DCL, Dan, Hunter's Creek. All right, I think that's good to check in for a little bit today. And some people from Philly. Good to see you, good to see you. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of the kind of more wild news I think that happened this week, which was uh, that Bob Iger takes over as CEO. And this was an interesting post from the New York Post that says, so Bob Iger taking over and he thinks that the park prices are too steep, which is an interesting thing to say, because here's the thing with Bob Iger. I think that he did a remarkable job. I loved his book. I think he was a good figurehead for Disney. What he did with bringing in Star Wars and Marvel and uh, all of the other things that he did, 20, 20th Century Fox and the IP that he expanded Disney. He did a, an amazing job with the stock. And, and I think he was just fairly well loved. The problem with Chapek that came in, Bob, he just was like probably a decent business guy. He was going to worry about the stock, even though the stock dove 41%. Uh, but he just wasn't like connecting with the fans as well and the cast and a lot of that stuff. Bob is Bob Iger is very good at doing the things he needs to do for business, but then also doing what he does to please the fans. And I think that that's where what makes him potentially a good politician one day. Um, but let's check it out. So Bob Iger thinks that Park prices are too steep. There was a new uh, move to raise pricing again. And this isn't the first time that they've raised pricing at Disney. They've raised it over and over and over again. And what's so wild to me is that actually park attendance is through the roof, but it seems like guest satisfaction is kind of going down, which is probably the big thing that people are looking at. It's like, hey, listen, we don't mind paying a little bit more if we also get an amazing experience. And I think that that's what Disney was so well known for. But here's the thing that I'm most concerned about as a real estate agent, as a homeowner in Lake Nona, as kind of like an Orlando guy, I'm so much curious about what happens to the Lake Nona facility. Now, if they look at potentially canceling that project, I mean, it's a billion dollar build out. It really is a really big kind of thing for Lake Nona. That's kind of thing that I'm paying attention to. If his, if his mandate from the board is get satisfaction back with the fans, get the stock price where it needs to be, become a more profitable company, then maybe he looks at not relocating 2000 jobs from LA in a couple of years. You know, it was supposed to be this year. And then all of a sudden they stopped it and said, Hey, we're going to push that off 25, 26. By that point, he might be gone like because he only signed a two year extension. So we'll see what happens. I think that Lake Nona in itself is going to do well regardless. But you add an extra 2000 jobs and a billion dollar campus. That's a big, big deal. And so I don't know what their whole thing with Tavistock is and if it's something that they can even back out of without massive repercussions. Um, but I think as a homeowner in the Lake Nona area, you probably want that to still move forward. It's going to expand the town center. Again, more jobs creates more opportunity and a lot of cool things. So let me know what you think. 
Ben, man, I appreciate your shout out. Thank you so much. Give him a little, little spiff there. That means a lot. Long time no see. I've been doing a lot more videos lately, L less lives, more videos. And I think I'm going to get back to doing a, a live a week a little bit more consistently. So, uh, so yeah, anyhow, let's see. Kevin from Lakeland. You're like right in the middle, Kevin. I did a video to, uh, this past week. What, like, what's better? You've got the, uh, the Tampa people or the Orlando people, but Lakeland, you're right in the middle. You're like Orlampa. You get right in the middle. You get the best of both worlds, 45 minutes from each area. Um, what's going on from Martha's Vineyard? What's going on? Earthscape, Martha's Vineyard. That's fantastic. Um, what's up from Seattle? Oh, there we go. I was waiting for the seat. What you guys are go blue. You work for U of M hospital too. That's amazing. Well, um, thank you for your, your, your work that you do helping all those people up in Michigan. Um, let's see. All right. So AK says chap Chapik, several blunder blunders, the ticket price increases, the genie plus debacle, the shoddy park maintenance, half the rides are broken. There's a, there's actually a running list online of all of the things that are broken in the parks that have never come back. And here's an interesting thing going back to the Lake Nona thing and, and the pause and also the condition of the parks, AK is it's interesting because you have uh, this labor shortage, you've got a supply shortage, you've got COVID, you've got so many things that happened over the past two years that I think Iger actually exited at like the perfect time. And it was a bit abrupt, right? COVID's coming and then all of a sudden he's out. And then Chapek has to step in and say, okay, with a labor shortage, with all the other kind of stuff, inflation going crazy, I have to raise prices and I don't have enough people. One of the main reasons I think that they actually did pause moving from LA to Orlando in terms of the Imagineering department. And this is, again, I don't have massive insight in other than just talking to cast members and other clients that I've worked with. So just kind of picking up the tea leaves here. Um, I think that they were having trouble getting people to move from California to Orlando, because if you're an Imagineer and you lose your job, you have to go back to California because there's not a ton of jobs here. You've got Universal and Disney, and now I guess a little bit of SeaWorld, right? Uh, they're getting more into the crazy park outside of the animal stuff. Um, I think that they were just having a hard time getting people to move. And so then at that point, they have to say, okay, fine, we're gonna give you guys a severance package in LA, and then we're gonna have to go hire people from New York and DC and Nashville and all over the country in sort of supplementing the people, then retraining those people. It's just a massive kind of thing in one of the tightest job markets we've ever experienced. So I could imagine how it would have been a tough sort of thing. Uh, but then, yeah, you get you need more people in the parks reinvesting back into it to make sure the animatronics are working and the rides are working and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, that's my rant on Disney I love Disney. We were there this morning. If you have not rode Guardians of the Galaxy yet, it's the best ride ever. Um, but Cosmic Rewind, uh, they did a Christmas overlay. And so instead of Run Run Rudolph, it was Run Run Rocket. So we did that this morning as they changed over the music. Very, very cool. Um, all right. So let's get into some real estate news because that's kind of what I do um, more than anything. But let's see. So NARS Lawrence Yoon, who has been the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors for a very long time. And the guy usually hits it on the nail in terms of what's going on. The guy's just super smart. Uh, they had the NAR, the National Association of Realtors next event here in Orlando, actually. Um, wildly enough, I was traveling and I missed it. But he got up and said, here's kind of what I think is going to go on. And so here's a couple points that he makes. Housing inventory is about a quarter of that of what it was in 2008. So our last massive crash, if you will, or the recession. Distressed properties are almost non-existent at just 2%, nowhere near the 30% mark that we saw during the housing crash. Crash And short sales are near impossible because of the significant price appreciation over the last two years. And so his whole thing was essentially, if we keep seeing interest rates 7% or under, and so depending on the mortgage product you're going to get, you can get it in the fives again, high fives. But uh, if you're looking at a five, one arm, a 10, one arm, high fives, mid sixes is pretty standard right now. And so as long as we don't jump up into the eights and nines, he doesn't actually see the market pulling back. And I have to, to be honest with you, I, I keep looking at the numbers over and over here in Orlando specifically, because real estate is hyper local. You could be in, um, you could be in Seattle right now and they've had a massive pullback. They've got like, you know, 10% price drops, which isn't, I mean, when you think about prices went up 25% over the past year, it's not really that big of a deal, a big, big of a difference. Um, but they had a, a pullback for sure in Orlando. Here's kind of what's going on. Cause I think that this is probably one of the things people care the most of. So I look at, okay, here's, here's over the past seven days. And again, this is something that I do on every one of my lives the past seven days, the five County area being orange, Osceola, Polk Lake, and Seminole counties. 
we had 539 new listings, which is not a lot. That's actually the lowest it's been in probably four months. Uh, we had 723 go pending. So offers accepted. And there were more solds than there were new listings. Now, here's the other crazy thing. This price decrease right here, this used this was a thousand. This number was a thousand houses adjusting their price down every single week um, for the past three months. Now it's kind of actually more on par with new listings. So this is all really good news. And then I jump over here and this is what they call the, the Monday morning quarterbacks. This is through 1119 of this year. And you look at the average final list price is actually up and the median sales price is is probably down $5,000 over the past month. So 1%. If you look at how, here's a really interesting one. If you guys are out buying a house right now and you're like, what's a good number to offer? Because we know comps that are a year old or six months old are probably a little too old. And I have people come to me like, hey, the market's softening. Should I go in at 85% of the list price? No, you should still work with your realtor and figure out what's a good price. Do you need concessions? Do you need repairs done? Do you need other things like that? Put together what, what makes the most sense for you. Uh, but here's some interesting numbers to me. Um, the final list price to sales price, on average, people were getting $13,000 off. So if you take that into the 4,000 4, or 400,000, roughly median average sales price or average sales price of $457,000, 13 grand off is not a lot of money. You're talking two and a half percent or so. And so on average, homes are still selling for roughly 98% of what they're asking. And so just keep that in mind if you're out there and you're one of those people that are going to be moving over the next year. But going back to what Lawrence said, I'm going to get to some of your questions. So make sure you guys drop those down below. If you have questions about Disney or real estate or living in Orlando, feel free to ask. Nothing is off the table. I'm pretty open book. Um, so going back to Lawrence though, and what he's saying is he does believe that we're going to see kind of a flat 2023. In 2023, Yoon predicts home sales, home sales, like the number of home sales to decline by 7%, while the national median home price will increase by 1%. Which honestly, if you look at like here locally, if you're seeing that more pendings than new listings, that means the market is pretty darn stable. And um, and so anyways, he thinks that in 2024, that there's going to be a 10% jump of home sales and a 5% increase, which is really more normal. Like, like I hate seeing 10, 20% price increases in a year. Like I, I hated that. I mean, I was saying it a year ago, two years ago as fast as we were growing, not healthy at all. Um, something like a three to 5% is where we want to be kind of beating inflation a little bit. That's a really healthy market. All right, let's see what's going on. Um, uh, Seattle is ridiculously expensive. Orlando is a different market in general. It's still affordable. That's very true, especially with the amount of people like moving here and then working from home and getting some of those salaries from other places. Uh, we're still seeing more people doing that than leaving to go back home. Um, that was actually an interesting thing. Somebody had mentioned this to me the other day. Um, how many people did we help move here because they were able to work remotely versus people that had to then go back. And we have had a few people that we've helped. And, and my, my team and I, we help roughly 40 to 50 people every single month relocate to Orlando, which is a ton. Um, and we're probably seeing one a month leave. Like, hey, we moved here because we could work remotely and now we got to go back home. And so that's a, a small microcosm. I mean, there's 7,000 sales happening in Orlando every year. Um, well, times two, there's a buy side and a sell side. So 14,000 that are here every year. And so, um, yeah, it's a small, small stamp sample sizing, but the fact that we deal with so much relocation and so many of our clients stick with us, if it is time to sell, it's an interesting time. Uh, Jay asked a good question. How accurate is the Zestimate price in, in Zillow? But let me show you something. I think this is interesting personally, if you don't, then yeah, it is what it is. Um, so let me go over here. Let's bring up Zillow. I think you might find this interesting, Jay. Um, where it used to be Zestimates, you click here. And then here's, here's this is interesting because they, they track all of the major cities and they say, okay, so median error. So number of homes with Zestimates, 15,000, and that's in the city of Orlando. So they don't count, count suburbs. Uh, median error is 2% is what they say. Within 5% of the sales price, 84%. Within 10% of the sales price, 96%. And with, within 20% of the sales price, 99 So basically they're saying, hey, we're 100% right 
80 percent of the or within 20 percent of the sales price that's a pretty big swing i mean two percent is what they're saying but what we're noticing a lot jay is that zillow it'll be like say your house is worth seven hundred thousand dollars and the zestimate shows 650 we'll list a house for 700 and all of a sudden the zestimate changes to 700 it's kind of like i mean it's an algorithm that a computer looks at and if zillow was right then they wouldn't have lost a billion dollars on, actually, I think it was several billions of dollars on their home flipping scheme that they were running earlier this year and last year, which is where they would come in and say, hey, your house is worth a half a million dollars. We'll buy it for whatever the Zestimate is, no costs. And then they would wait till the market picked up and then they would resell it. Unfortunately, they got caught owning real estate because they overbought so much. If you Google this, it's all over the country. The amount of uh, Zillow offers that were out there. Other co homes like off or other companies like Offerpad, if you look at their stock, it's in the tank. They lost a ton of money doing this as well. And so I think Zillow, here's what Zillow is great for. Zillow is great to start your home search process. It's a great way to figure out what kind of homes are in certain areas, ballpark pricing, all that good stuff. But when you're actually looking to make real decisions and really like hamper down on investment advice. That's when you want to reach out to an agent that actually knows what they're talking about. Cause Zillow is not going to know, do you back to a major road? Do you back to a lake? Do you back to conservation? Do you have upgrades in your house? There's just no way for them to kind of know that. And I know I'm kind of going on and on about it, but Zillow and Redfin being that they're the two biggest portals out there. Most people look at those little estimates as Bible. And so knowing that um, there's a little bit of play there and what they're actually for, which is grab your information as a consumer and sell it to a realtor. That's the only reason Zillow and Redfin exist. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cool tool to start, start, start the process. Um, let's see. Diego, what's on my friend? I appreciate it. Of course, man. Do I think that people who bought over prices should hold or still list? That's a good question. So I think that the horizon matters a lot. I think that 2023 in certain markets, things will pull back. And so I do believe that if you bought in like May, May or June of this year, maybe even April of this year, you probably lost a little bit of equity at this point. And so if you're not willing to write a check because you have commissions, you've got transfer tax, you've got title fees, plus your, your value of your home maybe went down 1%, you probably should wait two or three years potentially to kind of recoup. But if you're like, hey, I would rather sell now, know exactly where I'm at, and then get into that next new home. Right now is a great time because you have sellers and builders that are offering crazy incentives. And so if you want to be able to take advantage instead of it being such a hot, hot market, then now is the time you sell. But you have to just go into it. I mean, not everybody has equity. You know, I would say that anybody who bought a year or longer ago, they've got equity. Uh, typically a lot of it. Hopefully that helps. Um... So John, you're asking the uh, the inventory, did it go up? So let's pull this back up. So any good, new, uh, good news for whom? Inventory up. Yeah, in inventory is up because you had new listings hit the market. But then if you look at the amount of went pending and sold are actually higher than the new listings hitting the market. So if you look, that actually makes a lot of sense in terms of they're just being a really solid market. If you look at average days on market, so average days listing to contract is 47. So this is up like, um, and then average days of contract, once you finally get a contract under close. So if there's a mortgage involved or whatever, on average is taking 36 days from the day you accept a contract to the day that you actually close. And so that number 47 is up five days over last month. It was 42 days. And so the way you know, if on average, if it's taking for people like, Anything three months or less currently is considered a seller's market. Anything three to five months is a balanced market. And anything over five months would be considered a strong buyer's market. And so the fact that we're still at 47 days, I know is a lot longer than the 47 hours it used to take to sell your house just a few months ago, but it's still a really stable thing. And honestly, if it stayed this way forever, I would be happy. If it took on average 40 days to sell someone's house, that's a really kind of like healthy market. Um, 47 hours is not, not it. That's not good. Um, Jess, another good question. So is it true that buyers are losing their deposit from a year ago if they back out of the contract? So this is builder to builder dependent. So some builders are really sticking strong on, if you sign a contract with us, we are not letting you out. Other ones are, uh, are letting people out. 
And now that you brought this up, and so it's builder to builder dependent. Um, that being said, like if you locked in a year ago and you're still you're still haven't closed, you probably still have equity. Like I closed on a deal two weeks ago with somebody in Lake Nona. It took 18 months for them to finally close on their deal, and they still close with hundred thousand dollars in equity. And so they were like, you know, do we walk away? Yes, the interest rates higher for sure than what we expected 18 months ago, but we still close with a ton of equity. So for them, it didn't make sense to to back out. Um, here's an interesting one. For you guys, I, I talk about um, KHOV every once in a while. I think overall KHOV does a good job building their houses. Um, so they have this, this neighborhood called Osprey Ranch. This is over in Winter Garden, the Horizon West area. And it's, uh, it's, a, nice, it's a nice neighborhood. Like, I mean, it, or it's going to be, it's still going to be a nice neighborhood. But here's what's going on. So uh, they're building another, um, another phase, 16 to $18 million phase, I think three on this one. Uh, but here's the problem of what's going on with this neighborhood. Um, and if you're from KHOV, I get a lot of builders that reach out to me and you want to fact check me on this, let me know. But this is what we found because we had multiple buyers in this neighborhood that were getting ready to move forward. And KHOV took this neighborhood and sold the great majority over to an investor who just decided to come in and buy the whole neighborhood and turn it into rentals. And this is an interesting case because you look at JP Morgan, they just announced that they're going to spend $1.5 billion on buying residential homes. So they believe in what's going on. Um, and you've got a lot of these other Wall Street investors, BlackRock and all these other places talking about they want to raise 10 to 15 billion additional dollars to buy residential property. Um, and so let me show you real quick. So I think this is a problem. And so here we go. JP Morgan. Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. JP Morgan aims to acquire $1 billion in single family rentals. They team up with Haven Realty Capital to exploit the lull in home building. And so many of these big hedge funds are going out there. They still believe that real estate's a great investment and that there's a lull in the market. So why not take advantage of it? They're looking at for the long haul. And so they're going into these neighborhoods and they're saying, hey, Kahov, you guys were building this brand new development. Things have slowed. Would you rather have one client instead of 300? we're going to get a little bit of a discount and then rent the entire neighborhood out. Now, I actually think this is a problem. I think that um, nothing wrong with renting. I, again, like 35% of Orlando people that live here are renters. I, ha I own rental property. I love it, right? But when you have entire neighborhoods where one person owns the great majority of the single family residences, it's hard to keep up sort of standards. And then also when JP Morgan's decides, hey, we want to liquidate, do you think that they're actually going to care about the two or three other people living in the neighborhood that have equity or care about their equity or are actually homeowners? Um, I don't think so. And so I think this is a problem. I think that, um, you know, I'm not a really big government intervention kind of guy, um, but I do believe that local municipalities could regulate some of this. I do know for a fact here in Orlando, there's multiple different homeowners associations jumping out there and saying, hey, listen, if you buy here after X date, you cannot rent it out unless you've owned it for at least a year or sometimes two years, or sometimes indefinitely, because they don't want to turn into an all rental community. They would rather have homeowners that care about their place that are going to keep it at a little bit of a higher standard. So let me know down below. What do you think about this? You know, is this a problem? Do you see this as like no big deal? If you were buying in say like Osprey Ridge, um, would you back out? Or would you say it's no big deal and, and keep moving forward? I I'm curious. Um, Jay, man, you're always fire, fire content, man. Fire questions. Lumber costs has come down 40% from January. It's good news for buyers. Hopefully it will translate to lower home costs. Also like shipping, like you got so many things that we have windows, trusses. There's so many things that come from other countries that, you know, getting, getting it shipped here. Costs have come down almost 40% back to pre pandemic levels. So hopefully some of that translates over to lower costs as well. Um, and Annette says, I think this is a worrying trend. I agree. Um, Terp says, do I see any signs of substantial price decreases in the St. Cloud Sunbridge area? So St. Cloud, I think farther out, we are seeing more and more builder incentives because as you get farther out anywhere, you are going to essentially pull out demand. Um, builders are not going to have as much buyer traffic. And so they're going to try to incentivize. Sunbridge has seen some, but not nearly as much as other areas. Um, so all builders are offering incentives right now. Um, to try to keep things going along. Like they've got lots to sell. They've got homes that are typically already constructed with spec homes and all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. But no, Sunbridge, I haven't seen as much as some of the farther outbuilders. Um, 
NYC Iron, good to see you, my friend. Uh, off topic, but who's the builder seller of the apartments or condos being built in Olympus? Man, I don't know. I'm going to put a note down to find out for you. Um, do, 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 do. All right. All right. So I got an interesting thing for you guys, for those of you watching. Um, so there's this interesting thing over in East Orlando. Um, so Orange County Commissions, this is by the Growth Spotter, by the way. Um, Orange County Commission seeks more equitable deal with developer over landfill cleanup project. And so this is, to me, I was like, landfill cleanup project. That seems interesting. Um, and, and what are they doing there? They're going to be building over 1,500 apartments and uh, 100,000 square feet of retail office, that kind of thing. And Mayor Deming's on, uh, office is like, hey, we, we want to get a little bit more money for this. And so I kind of dug in a bit more. First off, like, where is this thing at? So here's where we're at. So you've got um, Lake Underhill Road, which is right here, which needs to be extended. Let me zoom out a little bit. So downtown Orlando is right here. You've got the Orlando Economic or uh, Orlando Executive Airport here. And then sort of right down the 408 over to Alfea, Alfea, zoom in here. And you've got what is essentially this little piece of land right here, which doesn't look huge, but apparently it's big enough to put 1500 um, apartments and a bunch of retail and kind of really help this whole, this whole area on this side of town, which I think is needed. You got the 417 running up right here. But anyway, um, apparently I started figuring out who is it, who are these people? What's going on, right? So you've got Fieldstream Village. Um, and here's what's going on with them. They want to, this is what they want to put there. Community plan, um, they want to take what is 400,000 tons of garbage and remove it and clean up the land and then basically put the apartments here. Right now, the city of Orlando owns it, or the city, I'm sorry, the Orange County owns it, and they pay something like $8,000 a year to monitor the, the groundwater around it to make sure that it's not leaking into other neighborhoods nearby, but essentially they're not doing much. Like they're, it's just sitting there. And so this developer says, Hey, we want to come in. We want to get rid of all the trash. We want to clean up the property and make sure that it's the way it needs to be. And it's going to add $3 million in tax revenue. And then, you know, we'll be good to go. Uh, but it's interesting to me like that. I know there's so many like high level, like how many, how many different um, tests need to be done for groundwater cleanup to make sure that it's actually safe to live in. But 1500 apartments is a ton. And so they're basically saying, hey, we're going to invest $25 million. It's 16 million for uh, 16 million for the cleanup. It's import $4 million for the fill. And then, you know, construction management fees and all that kind of stuff, $25 million to turn what is essentially an eyesore and a potential groundwater issue um, into revenue. And, and, and the county saying, they're pushing back saying, hey, we kind of want more money because we'll potentially lose, um, we'll lose revenue based on like, if you don't pay us off a certain amount, it, it seems like they're basically being a little greedy, in my opinion, to take a dump and turn it into something that's viable makes a lot of sense. But would you live there? That's my curiosity. Like, would you feel comfortable enough once it gets cleaned up? Is, is this like a place that you would be cool calling home? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really more curious than anything. Let me know what you think. Yeah. And then rent, rent will start at $2,500 enough. So here's the interesting thing in that. I think that I'm very pro development, especially because the more supply you can throw into the market, the lower the rents come down. And so if you look at like the whole rent stabilization thing that just passed, this typically pushes developers out of the area because they want to be able to make as much money as possible. That being said, the more supply we can bring in, hopefully keeps rents going down where they need to be. So this is an interesting thing from Orange County to say like, hey, we want more supply, but we're going to get in the developer's way by asking for like significantly more money. Uh, it's just interesting to me. Jay, I agree. St. Cloud is underrated. I think that's the new uh, Sunbridge area I think is like really great. I think that that once like Osceola Parkway goes in and Sunbridge really gets built out and Narcusi actually has hopefully a little bit more ins and outs. So the traffic's not as bad. It's going to open up St. Cloud into something really special. So I've been bullish on it for quite some time. Mm. <laughs> uh, let's talk Disney. Do you think the, the Iger return hearing park reservation is going away for the daily guests? Yeah. I mean, I hope so. I talked about Iger early on. So make sure you watch the replay uh, what I think is going on with Iger and what I think is going on with uh, with, the, with the Orlando in general. Uh, I talked about that as the first story. Um, but in terms of reservations, I think that that would be great. 
you know, living here, being able to just like pop over big deal. You know, it's a huge deal when you're living here. Uh, Cliff says, I've seen Florida legislation being passed that requires HOA to be fully funded by 2025 um, with no means to to waive that requirement. Something to worry about for short-term rentals. So I don't think I don't think that's, that's a, a bad thing. I mean, have, having an HOA fully funded, what, what, what they don't want to have happen is like what happened in 07, 08, 09, even through like 2013, where we had HOAs here that were defunct and all of a sudden the, everything's falling apart. And so I think that the legislation, there's something else behind it. And so let me dive in a little bit more to figure out why that is. But on the whole, I think that's a totally okay thing. Um, Tuesday says, um, well, what about houses? Are they still building houses in Orlando? Yeah, a ton. It's still like 30% of the sales that we do here are new construction and builders are getting really aggressive. They're offering crazy, like good incentives, helping you buy down your rate for like two years. They call it a two, one buy down where they'll basically put money aside for you to have a lower payment. And you've got like, so say a good example is say, say your, your interest rate six and a half percent. They'll make it feel like four and a half percent for the first year five and a half percent the second year and then it goes to six and a half percent the third year with hopes that within the next two or three years that rates will come back down now you need to be able to afford the six and a half percent to get um to get approved for it because what they don't want to have happen is that you get to year three and all of a sudden you foreclose um but it'll at least give you some cash flow in the meantime and then if rates come down you can refinance lots of builders are doing this almost as like a standard um in many neighborhoods um, does your team help with finding rentals during the home buyer process? We have to rent before buying after selling our house in Michigan. So we just started doing this a little bit more because um, what's interesting is like I'm from Michigan and I know that when I helped do rentals in Michigan, they would give us um, a, a bigger, a higher fee to help place a tenant in Orlando. There's been this weird thing that like landlords and property managers pay us like 25 bucks or 35 bucks. And we can spend a week with somebody finding a rental and make 25 bucks. So it just doesn't really make sense. Most of the time I suggest people reach out to the property managers directly. So we just started this new service on our team where we do offer uh, tenant representation. And if you're interested, um, we've got a financial kind of thing that we can work out. Um, and then if that doesn't work for you, we can at least point you in the right direction, figure out exactly where you want to be, give you some information on who to call and the process, be a resource for you with the hopes that when you do come back around that you use us to, to buy the house. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. I missed a ton of questions. Uh, Florida man says also interested in West Haven and ovation. I saw the models and landscaping and electric turned on any updates would be appreciated. So West Haven, Yeah. So right now is, is the, they're starting to sell again. So they're, they're definitely by January, you're going to be able to start pulling the trigger at West Haven, which is a toll brothers community in South horizon, West South winter garden, uh, kind of the same thing. Um, and so speaking of that area, BTW, this is an interesting one by Pulte. They're getting ready to pull the trigger, um, up in Daniels road, Daniels and Roper. This is actually, I guess, more Northwest winter garden, but they're going to do 80 foot lots, which if you know anything about the new construction in Orlando, most of the stuff we see here are 40, 50 and 60 foot lots. So kind of tiny and very close together, but Pulte saying that they're going to do an 80 foot lot product. Um, not a huge neighborhood. It's going to be, it's only on 31 acres. So there's probably going to be, let's see, 41 of them that are going to be there, which I think are pretty fantastic. Um, this is actually a picture of the grow neighborhood. Um, but anyways, I think that they're starting to listen to the fact that people are like, I don't always want a neighborhood where I can jump from roof to roof, which I'm excited about. I hope that this, we see more and more of this starting to happen. Um, but I guess time will tell them. All right. What else we got here? Mm -mm -mm. Someone else about short-term rentals or new construction. Here's another one I saw Windsor Island resort phase three Windsor Island resort has been really good for us in regards to sales, just because people really like it. It's a good product, good area, short-term rentals, but they're getting ready to, to wind up phase three of the subdivision. They've valued it at $50 million in regards to how much they're going to be spending there. Um, sales spec homes, apartment condos, one to three stories, uh, swimming pool and a social club. Um, they're going to be starting the project later this year, like right now. And so, um, yeah, definitely new construction abounds <laughs> throughout central Florida. We have a ton of land and the farther out you go, the better you deal you get. Uh, but there's plenty of opportunity if that's kind of your thing. All right. I'm going to scroll back up because I know for sure, as I went on a little bit of a Disney rant, 
<laughs> AK says, uh, super excited about Iger coming back for sure. Uh, Victoria from New York. I can't wait to get back to my swimming pool <laughs> in, in Florida home next week. We're excited to have you back. It's chilly to me. I'm, I'm like, I'm chilly. It's like, uh, well, today was decent, but like it was it's like in the fifties and sixties in the morning. And it was, it was a little bit much for me. Mm. Ba, 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 ba. So Tuesday says, um, I would like to move to Orlando, but I'm worried about the sinkholes and which areas are sinkhole prone or sinkhole territory. You know, it's interesting. A lot of insurance companies now require you to get sinkhole inspection prior to buying a house. Um, there definitely are sinkholes exist there, like Lake Eola, the giant Lake Eola in the middle of Orlando. That's technically a sinkhole was a sinkhole 80 feet deep kind of thing. Um, but we just don't see massive issues here in central Florida. Now, like hills, like west, west central Florida. So like outside beyond Lake County, I forget the area. Is it Hillsboro area? Anyways, they have a lot more than we do. Spring Hill area. They've got a lot more than we do. Um, but you can get an in insurance inspection along the way if that's something that's important to you. And there's also a different, if you Google sinkholes, Florida, there's actually little pockets. It'll show you where the majority of them have happened. Um, if that's kind of important to you. Um, all right going back up sorry just trying to go back up to the top where i know i missed a bunch of them anyways what did you guys while, while i'm looking for this my curiosity is did you celebrate thanksgiving and if so what was the best thing that you ate i gotta know because we went to a, a little potluck buffet i had I had um, sweet potatoes with the marshmallows on top for the first time in like 10 years. Blew my mind. I got a little ill because I ate too much of them. <laughs> Anyways, um, well, I had one more thing I wanted to show y'all and then we were going to wrap up for it today. Oh, I know what it is. So I go through, this is just part of my, let's see. Oh no, what happened? Oh gosh, kind of disappeared on what was going on here. Oh, here we go. So a lot of folks ask about Bella Kalina, and we've gotten more and more inquiries about this because trying to find something that is uh, lakefront and also newer and also in a gated community that's not $7 million is kind of harder to come by. And so I, I actually really like Bella Kalina. I think that's got a lot of things to offer. And this is one of the houses that just kind of popped up to me. Um, so this one newly listed four and a half million, which I know is a lot of money, but it's 7,600 square feet, big house um, with a, with a lake view, which is like, again, if this was Windermere, this is Isleworth, this house would be $8 million, seven and a half million dollars. Um, and I'm curious, what do you guys think of this style with kind of like the two story open? It's very modern. I feel like inside. So four and a half million is what they're asking. Super sleek, right? Like everything with the with the glossy finish on the cabinets. But let me show you guys outside because I think that this is what really sells it. This pool area is insane. You also have a lot of like actual trees and a little bit of land, which is again, really kind of tough to come by. Um, I'm gonna shoot through this. Please forgive me. Oh, here we go. Look at this thing. Little basketball court inside. Got the sauna. The two store, the two story closet, which I think is like, that's pretty choice in my opinion. Um, let me get out of here though. I want to show you guys the views outside because that's what really sells this house and why it's the the price that it's going to be. Let me get backwards actually. Here we go. All right, so this is the outdoor space. That's the view. You've got like just crazy views and sunset views with a lot of land. Anyways, four and a half million dollars. So if you're th thinking Bella Kalina, they also have like golf course villas that are like in the six, seven hundred range, and then all the way up to custom stuff that are four, five, six million dollars. So really interesting to me. I think that um, when you're looking at like what's actually out there that's gated, new construction, um, close to kind of a decent amount of everything, like Bella Kalina is a good option there. Um, did I find Bob a new house? <laughs> find a new home job. I did not. Um, he actually never bought a house here, which is another thing. Like a lot of the executives started moving here and buying stuff here, but no, he bought a big house in Westlake. Um, let's see. 
Quentin says, thanks again for the tip on asking my builder to let me out of my deposit or use the, use the deposit for the future. If you backed out, I'm going to use those funds to buy a rental property. That's great, man. So this is a huge tip, I guess, for that Quentin obviously took advantage of, but if you haven't as well, many of the builders out here are saying, Hey, listen, if you don't move forward, buying a house or buying the house that you contracted on, some of them will let you use your deposit. They'll let you out of the contract and then let you use that deposit for a future build. If you build it with them within the next, typically they put a time frame on it, a year, six months, something like that. And so it's a way to at least not fully walk away from your deposit. It allows them to keep you as a client, allows them to keep your money and kind of your commitment to move forward. So um, some builders, again, every one of them is different. Everyone, every builder is at a different stage in their construction for the neighborhoods. Some offer incentives like this, some don't, but um, it's always interesting. You know, you want to be creative. You want to figure out what's going to work best for you as the buyer, but then also got to explain that builders are here to make money. Like they're not doing this for charity. Um, so it's interesting. Um, what are home prices like around Lake Yolo? What's going on Palm Beach is Paul. If you guys are down in the Palm Beach area, Paul's a good agent. Um, so dude, downtown is interesting. Um, Lake Yola Heights area and Thornton Park and those kind of areas. Um, 32801, I'll show you. Um, they're all over, man. It's like, you know, you can get a townhouse or a, a, a high rise, which I think is interesting. Let's see, show you some of these. Boop, right here. You can get, you know, 279 grand. It's a thousand square feet. Nothing, nothing kind of crazy, but it's a condo with decent amenities and that sort of thing for 279. I mean, this one's been on the market for 60 days. The problem with this one is it's kind of close to the, the, the turnpike. So like it's a little noisy, um, but the location's kind of sick. It's like really good in my opinion, um, all the way, you know, up to something out like Eola, crazy penthouse for 2.7 million. And this is 4,800 square feet, four bedroom. This is in the sanctuary. Um, crazy, you know, super cool views. I think really nice finishes in general. Um, so it's all over depending on what you're looking for. And it's not just condos. There's also single family houses, like smaller little houses. Let's see if I can find something for you. Here we go. I think this area is just crazy cute. They've got the brick roads like this. You've got these smaller houses, um, with a lot of character. This house was built in 1924. And when you think Orlando, you don't think houses that were built in the 20s, uh, but two bedroom, one bath, and that's for 470, 475. So yeah, good question, man. I appreciate it. So that whole area is super nice, man. And, and the more that they invest in that area, you've got the new um, JW Marriott Convention Center going downtown. You've got a lot of new tall buildings. The city's investing in new park amenities around Lake Eola. And so there's bringing in little businesses and shops. I love the downtown area. I'm actually surprised. Um, more people aren't into it, but Thornton Park is amazing. College Park's amazing. Lake Yola area is, is pretty cool. So um, that's awesome, man. Kid's going to buy your first house next. How's it? Is, that, is it UCF? Is that what I remember? Um, Disney Manic. Disney Maniac, my bad. Um, hello from Seattle. Love your solar video and how it depress homes. Can I do one on pools? Yeah, hundred percent. Pools, you actually do get a, a good return on, or not not an amazing return, but you get something back. If you go spend a hundred thousand dollars on a pool, in most areas you're going to get forty to fifty thousand back. At least you're getting something, and then you get some utility out of it and some fun and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not a it's not a hundred percent typically ROI. Um, all right, so I think. Oh, here we go. Paul says that he had stuffing at your office. <laughs> I love it, man. You ended up in the ER for Thanksgiving. Oh no. Oh, hopefully working, hopefully working in the ER. Now that I remember what you do for a living for sure. Um, anyhow, uh, Marina says, Hey, just construction right next to Daniel's around RT. What's going on there. That's right near my house. So that's a new neighborhood by Pulte. That's going to be going in. That's going to be, uh, 41 new houses. So nothing crazy, but, um, uh, I think it's a good, good little neighborhood for somebody that's looking for a small enclave with a good, good price homes, good size houses, good size lots, all that good stuff. But anyways, I'm going to wrap up today. I hope you guys have an amazing holiday season. If you liked this, give me the thumbs up before you leave so that it gets pushed out. And I know that this is worth the time to spend some time with you guys on Saturday. I think it is because I really love hearing what you guys are thinking, your questions about Orlando real estate, just living in Orlando is pretty awesome. It's my favorite for sure. So anyways, appreciate you guys. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.